So hello everyone and thanks for coming to the talk and to the conference. So I'm Martinez. Yes, we are both long time Cilium contributors. And besides being passionate about Cilium and eBPF, we are also passionate about skiing. So yeah, today's talk is going to be about some changes to the Cilium's control plane, also known as Cilium agent. And in particular, it's about improving the resilience and fault tolerance of Cilium agent, which is one of the most critical components in your Kubernetes clusters. So let's start with the demo. Okay, uh, yeah, so we have a Kubernetes cluster, basically running some clients, some server pods, all of them communicating to cluster IP, and all of a sudden you get paged. Something is bro broken, like some apps are not working. As you start troubleshooting, and I highly suggest you don't do this bottom-up approach where you start disassembling BPF programs or hex dumping BPF maps, but you start with something more reasonable, like top-down approach, where you start looking into Cilium dashboard. And in this dashboard, we see that there are some drops happening, and the drops are happening because of the service backend not found, so something related to service load balancing. And then if we scroll down, yeah, we see the metric is going up. So then we scroll down and we see that some agents are reporting that the state is being uh, degraded. So something is wrong. And then if we keep going through the dashboard, we see that some of the BPF maps, which are responsible for services, got full. So this is quite a typical scenario. And we see this happening with policy maps, for instance, and sometimes with service maps. And then the component which is responsible for writing to those PPF maps uh, starts to report errors. We see the error counters going up over the time. And we see that there were recently some lots of update operations. So this operation duration for the service for update. And next we we'll use a bit of a low level tool. We dive into one of the Cilium nodes and we dump the status. So the health information, and then we see that one reconciler, which is responsible for service maps updates, reports a failure. And then let's look into the Cilium state. So we'll be talking a lot about the, this new components called StateDB in this talk. And we can see that the desired state is not being realized for the service maps. So we clearly see that the BPF map is full. So this, is, this gives us a lot of hints that this, uh, we might have too many services in the cluster. So either we need to increase the BPF map size or delete some. And for the demo, for sim simplicity, Let's delete some services. Yeah, it's pre-recorded because a lot of typing is needed. <laughs> okay, and then let's go back to the dashboard and we see that, let's wait a bit. And we see that the agents are in okay state, and we see that the maps are no longer full, and we should see the drops decreasing. Yeah, I should come. Yeah, so cluster is getting back to the healthy state. Okay, let's go back to the talk. So before we dive into the details. How pro tip for next speaker, charge your laptop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so before we dive into the details, how this was implemented, some historical context. So, Cilium started as a simple CNI with observability and security in mind. And one differentiating technology was BPF. And with BPF, 
we, we were very flexible what we can do. We can basically take any network packet and do any modifications we want to do. So then after solving the CNI problems, we started looking into Kubernetes generic networking problems. And you probably remember this picture from a long time ago. And what happened next is basically imagine a bunch of very curious and motivated engineers. You give, give to them this powerful tool, BPF, and then also give to them very interesting problems in the networking space. So of course, all of them will get eventually solved. So that's what happened to Cilium. And I would probably yeah, claim that the majority of networking problems are solved today. Kubernetes networking problems are solved today by Cilium. And the nice thing about it that in your cluster, you can just run a single component. You don't have multiple different components and making sure that they nicely interact with, with each other. But the downside of that, that the project became quite complex. Uh, but if you look under the hood of Selim, you see that's fairly like the workflow is fairly simple. So you have this agent running on some host, getting updates from Kubernetes API server, from some other components like Cilium's cluster mesh, parsing those updates and then writing to a local BPF maps, which are used for uh, by Cilium's BPF data plane. And of course, many things can go wrong. Like we can, uh, we might lose the connectivity to API server, API server might get overloaded or even the syscalls to the BPF infrastructure might fail. So for instance, a host run out of memory for a short period of time. So yeah, uh, I'll give a microphone to Yusi who will talk about how we deal with those failures. All right, so we're kind of zooming into the uh, bottom most picture here. How does the agent um, manage the reconciliation into the BPF maps? So let's take a simple example of uh, Kubernetes API server giving us an event about a Kubernetes service being created. And then we want to write it into the services PPF map. So one thing the agent could be doing here is just directly doing this as cool, writing it in as a received event. But this doesn't really work out since, well, the map might be full and we might not be able to do this operation right then and there. Uh, so we might need to retry it in the future. So we need something in between here. So we need to store the event in, in some data store and then schedule the reconciliation separately. Um, so if we kind of look at the architectural picture here, so this desired state kind of divides things into two. We have a, on top a control plane, which receives the events from different sources, API server, cluster mass API server, uh, REST API and so on. Um, it digests the events and computes the desired state. And then on the bottom, we have the part that then applies the desired state um, into the system. And many parts of the agent have been like, written in this pattern and in many different ways. So what we've been exploring is like, how do we unify this and how do we get um, observability out of this? How do we know that things are failing? How do we uh, extract health? Um, so, when, so we're going to talk about how to implement the desired state in a way that we have uh, good tools for inspecting it. And then we're going to talk about later about the reconciler and having a single implementation for it allows us to extract health and metrics out of it and get a better picture of what's going on in the system. So jumping into uh, the desired state, how, how do you implement this? So, so it's an in-memory database. So instead of kind of traditionally writing things, write your hash map, logs, uh, your subscriber pattern and so on uh, from scratch, instead we, we go for, for a database approach uh, that does these things for you. Uh, it's transactional, which allows doing writes in a single transaction, which can then be observed as a batch um, by the reader, which improves throughput. Um, if everything stores immutable in state DB, uh, in immutable trees, which allows for lockless readers. So then once we add more and more code into this, we're not worried about readers holding, holding locks too long or doing crazy things and callbacks and um, stopping process, uh, pro progress from happening. 
and everything is revisioned, so it, can, it allows us to query things as they change over time. And then there's a way of, of seeing if things change. So there's a channel-based notification mechanism uh, which tells us when something changes and can allow us to wake up the, the reader and, and do more work. Uh, internally, uh, it looks like this. So you have a uh, radix tree. Things are kind of uh, uh, prefix uh, uh, indexed. So then if you search for something, you do a byte-wise lookup. Um, and then on modifications, you do a clone of the change part of the tree. So then when you're inserting something, existing readers uh, are never affected. So I'm going to take a, give a quick example of quick example of how does the code look like? How do you use it from Go? Um, so to create a table, you first start by defining your data type. And this can be anything from structs to anything more complicated. Um, uh, you define your index. You define two, two methods telling state DB how do you crawl from your custom data type into the internal database key? And keys here are essentially just byte slices. And then the second thing you define is how do you go from a search key, which can be, again, any, any data type you want, um, any type of query you want, how do you go from that into a database key? And then finally, you can create a table giving it a name and the primary index and optionally any number of secondary indices. And then with the table created, we can do queries. Um, so for example, if we'd have a table of services and we've indexed it by namespace, uh, we can do a query using the namespace index and get all services in the default namespace. Um, and we get back an iterator, which hopefully soon with range func uh, proposal gets even nicer. Um, and here we get our service object, then we get a revision, so we can use the revision to see if, if something changed. And then we get a watch channel, which when it closes, tells us that now this query you did is invalidated, there's something changed in this index, and you need to query again. So with that, we have a common API for building all sorts of useful tools that are not dependent on the data type itself. And one of them we can demo there, the, the reconciler. So I'm going to jump into the reconciliation topic now. Um, so reconciler is a, is a reusable utility. You, you point it at a state DB table um, and you tell it what kind of things to do with the objects. So for example, um, if we have a backend object, um, we need to define the update, delete, and prune operations for it for the reconciler to work. So for example, here, an update op operation could be simply um, a PPF map update, for example, and, um, and a delete, just a map delete, or this could be more complicated multi-step operations, or it could be a network call, and so on. And let's look at how failures now would be, would be handled. So let's say our PPF map update fails, we get an eno space from the system. This would be then propagated upwards, the update method, uh, method would fail, reconciler would then um, shuttle a retry at a later time. It would then update metrics and health, it would, uh, like we saw in the demo in the beginning, we saw the error count going up, there was something failing. Then the agent health would, would be reported as decorated, the reconciler cannot reconcile all the objects. And then finally, the failing status would be written back in the state DP, and that can be inspected. Um, we saw that quickly in the demo, and here is it again. So we can, through Selim Debug, look at any of these tables and, and dump them, and, and we can watch it over time. So that's also something that revisioning gives us that we can, we can watch for, for new things to, to arrive. So in principle, this is like very, very similar to to what you get with Kubernetes as well, very similar concepts and APIs, just internally in the agent. And you have the same flexibility for, for adding new, new component, components to it and same guarantees that you are not gonna interact with other components in the system. All right, we're getting into summary. Um, so what we saw, showed here was an uh, example of the infrastructure um, 
So we saw StateDB and the ability to inspect it. We saw the reconcile error in action, and we saw the agent health, which is also a new component. Um, and in 116, we're going to have first use cases for this. So a lot of work's been done around uh, device detection and uh, node addresses. So a lot of the issues are, are being solved where agent wasn't reacting to device and IP address changes. So these are now being solved with these tools. Um, and yeah, new features are highly encouraged to start leveraging this to get better observability and, and resilience. All right, thank you. And at the bottom, there's a link if you're interested in like, how this is implemented, on the details, uh, you can look at the repository and there's an example there um, that shows a fairly complicated uh, example there. All right, any questions? Yep. Thank you for the presentation. Um, a question about the state of the uh, yep. memory database. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, I'm interested to know how you can guarantee, let's say, consistency or availability of the, the data you store in the, uh, in the state of the. So it's really meant to replace kind of handle stores of state within the agent. So it's a replacement for hash maps and protected by mutexes and, and notifications mechanism around that. So, so we have the same. Same requirements there, so it's all in memory. So if the agent restarts, it rebuilds the, the whole state from scratch. And we basically persist the state in BPF maps, and each time Cilium agent restarts, it restores the state from BPF maps, QPAPI server, and other inputs. So it's not meant to be durable store. Really. How is the memory usage compared to previous versions? So it's going to be very similar. Like if you look at, for example, the Kubernetes objects we receive, we are always unmarshalling a new object when we receive it, so we always have a, have a new copy. So where the difference might come is if there's a lot of readers holding on to old uh, snapshots of the database, that's where we might be only holding on to more data. Um, but it is comparable. So. What about consistency of the state DB between silly agents? How is that done? So that's all through QPAPI server or KV store. So some kind of none of those mechanisms change. So we're still in eventually consistent there. We're receiving events from outside and then reconciling. So there's there's no requirement for uh, like cross agent transactions and things like that. Although you could plug in raft into it and, and so on, which is basically how Nomad works. So it's very similar to that. So inside the agent, we didn't mention, we didn't emphasize, but basically also allows us to establish some communication patterns between different components, subcomponents in Cilium. So basically components can communicate through the state DB. So we have a bunch of reconciler loops and they're just watching some table updates. And if one component, let's say, I know, let's take the service example. And for the service, we show the inputs are a cube API server, et cetera, but there might be, I know, some feedback loop coming from Envoy. So that feedback loop can write into the database and the service manager will see some updates and react to it. Because right now, like we have a bunch of components and they, they are communicating in quite different ways, like locks, go channels, callbacks, et cetera, et cetera. So that could establish the communication, like big message bus for a Cilium agent. All right, yeah. thanks a lot.